Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the major updates from our neighbor Mars, but I guess more specifically from the Martian NASA mission, referred to as Mars 2020, with the rover known as Perseverance and the tiny helicopter known as Ingenuity. And in the last few months, since the last update video that you can find somewhere in the description or above my head, there actually have been some major discoveries slash updates including some discoveries that we're going to be talking about in this video that were somewhat surprising. And so let's jump right into this and let's discuss one of the most recent discoveries coming from the Perseverance rover and specifically coming from one of the instruments inside the rover known as the SuperCam microphone. The two microphones located on the rover that allow the rover to hear the sounds on Mars with some of the recordings that have been previously made available in the description below. And so the most recent study and the most recent analysis coming from the rover was actually able to very accurately measure the speed of sound on Mars. Now this is something that I personally was really surprised by because I've actually made a video about this based on a lot of research a couple of years ago, a video that you can also find in the description or somewhere right there. And in that particular video we've talked about what sound on Mars might actually sound like and also what sort of frequencies are going to be most prominent. But this recent research sort of discovered something almost entirely different. But it also was able to calculate the actual speed as well, determining that the speed of sound on Mars seems to be around 240 meters per second. Now when it comes to speed of sound, it obviously is different depending on the temperature, depending on the condition, and more specifically depending on the density of the material. So for example, even though here on planet Earth in the regular temperature of around 20 degrees Celsius, the speed of sound is about 343 meters per second, which is approximately 100 meters per second faster than on Mars, this actually suddenly changes in a much more dense material such as water, where the speed of sound is 1400 or actually 1480 meters per second. And the more dense the material, the faster the speed. But as you probably know, the atmosphere on Mars is less than 1% as thick as the one on Earth. So here we do expect the speed of sound to be much lower. Although I guess in theory you would expect it to be even lower than 240 meters per second. So it is pretty fast nevertheless. But this is of course not the surprise that was discovered. The surprise itself was in regards to the frequencies and how they differ in terms of speed. So first of all, in order to calculate all of this, the rover had to use its laser. Because by firing the laser, certain sounds were produced on the ground. But by measuring the time between the laser firing and the sound waves hitting one of the microphones inside the rover, the NASA team was able to actually very accurately calculate how various frequencies were reaching the microphone and how long it took for various frequencies of sound to reach the microphone. And what they've discovered is that the middle frequencies here were traveling at a very different speed. With all of this most likely due to the carbon dioxide molecule present at very low pressures. And so at frequencies above approximately 240 Hz, the molecules of carbon dioxide start to interact in such a way that they don't actually have enough time to relax. Which creates very unusual conditions where the higher the frequency, the faster the sound travels, with everything above 240 Hz traveling approximately 10 meters per second faster. Which of course suggests that if you were to somehow be able to talk on Mars without, I guess, the suit here protecting you, your voice would sound extremely different. First of all, you would hear a lot of high frequency sounds, followed by a kind of an echo of low frequency sounds, something that I think I would love to simulate one day, but I just don't really know how to do this yet. But that's of course assuming that you're able to talk on Mars without your helmet. That's not really something we can do yet because of the low pressures. But then on top of this, right above the surface, there is actually a slightly thinner layer known as the planetary boundary layer. And today it's believed that during the daytime, because of the additional warmth from the sun, all of this generates a lot of different convection currents, which probably change the way sound behaves as well. But that's not something we can investigate just yet, simply because it's kind of difficult to simulate all of this. Which means that the sound on Mars is probably a little bit different from what we thought. Okay, well then we have other updates, specifically from the incredible Ingenuity helicopter. The helicopter that's now completed over 20 flights and obviously has achieved so much more than anyone ever expected. As a matter of fact, as of making of this video, it just completed its 22nd flight and it's about to start its 23rd flight, covering the total of distance of approximately 4.75 kilometers with a total flight time of over 40 minutes, which is already groundbreaking on so many different levels. 
And since that last update, it did actually experience some problems. Specifically, it lost communication on flight 17 and even had a bit of a problem landing during flight 18. Mostly because the area where it was landing did not have enough features for the helicopter to establish correct height. And later on, flight 19 had to be postponed because of a relatively large dust storm that was approaching Jezero Crater. Which of course is the first time ever a weather delayed any kind of a flight on another planet. And during that Martian storm, the total sunlight received by the probe reduced by approximately 18%, while also surprisingly lowering the total density of the air on Mars by approximately 7%. And remember, the helicopter depends on the air density for its ability to fly, while obviously also depending on the sun for its energy. And so in this case, the scientists behind the mission had to wait approximately a month before they could continue flying the helicopter and continue assessing the results. And following the storm, quite a lot of dust was deposited on various parts of the helicopter. For example, they discovered that quite a lot of dust was on the navigation camera. And so in order to prevent various types of errors accumulating in the helicopter, the scientists had to update some of the software and include what's known as the image mask, as well as run several tests using the servo mechanisms available in a helicopter in order to provide enough data for the imaging sensor to then be able to navigate around Mars. On top of this, by running various tests using the servos, they were able to clear some of the sand that accumulated in the moving parts responsible for the motion of the rotor. And so following all of this, the Flight 19 was obviously a success as well. Then, during the flight number 20, it was actually able to fly for approximately 390 meters, and during the flight 21 was able to fly 370 meters, with the main mission now being scouting ahead of the rover, the Perseverance rover, and providing a lot of visual data of the area nearby. But the 22nd flight was not as exciting, with the helicopter only flying approximately 70 meters instead of the planned 350. But that's because it's actually preparing for a somewhat dangerous maneuver for the Flight 23, where it's going to be flying around the hill, and in order to do so, it's going to have to make a really sharp turn. In other words, it's not going to be a straight flight anymore. Nevertheless, so far this has been a super successful mission, and I'm only looking forward to see how far NASA can take this. But what about the rover itself? Well, one of the main problems with the rover so far has actually been rocks. A lot of rocks started to accumulate in various parts of the Perseverance rover. So, for example, for quite a while there was a rock inside one of the wheels on the rover. Which is of course kind of similar to what happened to the Curiosity rover back in 2017. But that by itself is not a problem, and NASA has never really had problems with rocks causing anything inside the wheels. A much bigger problem was from this part right here. The part that essentially collects the samples for the future mission that's going to be retrieving these samples. And you can kind of see that quite a lot of rocks accumulated in this area. With NASA recently choosing to dump some of the samples by opening the tubes in order to clear the debris that was getting stuck in the sample collector. Which is naturally one of the problems NASA did not anticipate and so they're going to have to find a lot of creative solutions if this happens again. And since the earliest date for the retrieval of these samples is around 2026 or possibly even in the 2030s, with the Lockheed Martin recently receiving the contract to develop the retrieval system for this mission, all of this means that the Martian rover has to survive for quite a few years and try to protect its sample collector in order to collect as many rocks as possible. And so at least for now, the NASA scientists might have to develop a slightly different technique for the retrieval part in order to avoid these anomalies in the future. But despite all of this, at least one major mystery coming from the Perseverance so far is actually in regards to rocks. Relatively recently, some of the analysis of the rocks available on the surface of Mars uncovered some unusual purple formations that to some extent resemble similar rocks we have here on planet Earth. Here's an example from Australia. And we sometimes refer to this as a rock varnish. A type of a coating that sometimes forms in various types of rocks because of the activity of various cyanobacteria on the surface of these formations. In other words, this is something that's formed by bacterial life, usually in the presence of water. And so one of the questions here is, of course, did something similar happen on Mars? And are these the signs of potentially ancient cyanobacterial life present on Mars as well. But even though right now it's kind of too early to tell, right now the scientists are using one of the laser instruments to try to drill to this and to try to see what they discover in terms of the chemical composition of these unusual rocks. So definitely quite a lot of exciting discoveries. 
And last but not least is this other thing that you can actually check out by yourself, which in this case is not part of the NASA mission, but is part of the United Arab Emirates mission known as HOPE. And essentially they were able to create a really detailed and somewhat interesting Atlas of Mars, naturally available for free in the link in the description below. And overall this represents a really interesting read for anyone interested in learning more about what we know about Mars today. Including, of course, the naming of most of the locations, why they're named so, and what we know about each of them in regards to geology and potential existence of liquid water. So do check it out in one of the links in the description below. But I guess on this note, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. We might come back and talk more about this particular atlas, or obviously some of the new discoveries coming from the NASA mission, but for now that's all I wanted to mention. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.